Heavenly Father, we read in your word about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are looking forward to that day. But help us that as we study that event today, that we might understand what the truth is and what the Bible says and the Bible only. Help us not to be deceived. Bless us through your word and through the Spirit as we study together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The second coming and the rapture. Our title for today. Welcome, dear friends, back to our series on the Bible. The Bible, give me the Bible, the Bible only. I uh, would again like to start with a question. And have you ever asked yourself the question, will there in actual fact be a second coming? Will Jesus really come again to this earth? And if that is so, how is that going to happen? How is this earth going to get or to come to its end. Well, there's a lot of speculation around this topic. Time ago, the magazine Time also speculated on this issue. Newsweek the other day asked the question, will asteroids destroy the Earth? A few years ago, the date of 2012-2012 was on everybody's lips. The 20th of December 2012. Some said that that would be the date of the end. That was the end of the ancient Maya calendar. And so people keep on speculating. Will it be the ecosystem that will be totally destroyed by man? Will it be a virus like the Ebola virus that will wipe out the population of the earth? Uh, will it perhaps be a bomb, much more devastating than the atomic bomb, that will blow the earth to pieces? Will it in actual fact be an asteroid that will crash into earth? Well, we as Christians actually ought to know that this world will not end with an asteroid or a bomb or a virus. Even if we look at the state of the world, look at our plantations today, how it looks like, uh, our rivers are all polluted to a very large extent. Our factories uh, leave dumps behind. Mining devastates the surroundings. Trees are just chopped and then nothing is planted anew. A wasteland of tires. Birds today feeding on plastic. Bare land after searching for oil. Someone surfing in the sea amid the rubble. But even this state of the world does not mean that one of these will be the end of it all. The world as we know it, brother and sister, will end with the triumphant return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's what the Bible says. And that, that was also the hope of all the believers throughout the ages. Paul is in jail 
He's awaiting death. And in spite of that, he writes to Titus. And he says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul rested in the hope that Jesus will come again. That should also be our hope. The question is, is it? When everything around you does not make any sense, when life does not make any sense, grab onto this hope. Jesus is coming again. Let us as Christians encourage each other with this hope. Why? Because one out of 25 verses in the New Testament is on the subject on the second coming. Should not that alone be enough for us as Christians to study the events surrounding the second coming? The Bible always has an answer. It's our only haven. So let's turn to the Bible and the Bible alone. Because if we, if we don't, we will be deceived. When Jesus' disciples asked him about the events surrounding the second coming, we read this in our previous presentation. Let's read it again. And as he said, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of your coming and of the end of the world? What did he say to them? What was his answer? What was the first words he said? He said to them, take heed. Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, dear friends, did you know that the technology of our day is already in place to present the second coming of Jesus in the clouds. Now I wonder if they should do something like that. How many Christians would run towards that event believing that it's real, that it's in actual fact the second coming? Jesus said that even the very elect may de be deceived. Let's read it. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So let's turn to the Bible and the Bible alone to determine what will happen when Jesus comes again. Let's start our study. Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then in Revelation 1, 4, 1 7 we read, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. False Christs might be able to appear here or there on earth, but no one, no false Christ, will be able to appear in the clouds so that everyone will be able to see him. Now, after Jesus finished his work on earth, he took his disciples to the Mount of Olives and he was taken away before their eyes. Let's read about that. And when he had said these things, while they were looking, he was taken up and went from their view into a cloud. I'm using the basic translation for this piece. And while they were looking up to heaven with great attention, two men came to them in white clothing and said to them, O men of Galilee, why are you looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Two angels 
from God came to comfort the disciples and assure them Jesus will fulfill his promise. And then we read in Luke 21, 27, And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And this is Jesus himself speaking. So nobody will need to tell you that Jesus has come. You will see him for yourself in the clouds of heaven. But there's more. He's not going to come in secrecy or appear somewhere on a remote spot. No, the Bible tells us that this is going to be a glorious event. Listen. And the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Then shall He sit on the throne of His glory. And then, verse 31, He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. He's bringing His angels with Him. Why? What will they be doing? The Bible answers us. They will fill the sky. But more than that, they will gather his elect from the four winds of the earth. In other words, the second coming will be a visible one. But even more than that, it's going to be an audible one. An audible event. And what's more, the righteous dead will be called to life. Have you ever read that verse in Bible? Let's read it. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In other words, the second coming will be visible, but it will be audible as well. You will see it and you will hear it. So incisive will the trump of God be that those who died in him will come forth from their graves. Can you envisage that moment, the joy of loved ones meeting each other again? But now, the big question if that is true, if that is what the Bible says, what then about the rapture? Isn't there going to be a secret rapture of God's children just before the final tribulation commences on earth? Now, let's just first ask the question, what does the doctrine of the rapture teach. Well, I'll try. Put in a short framework with some deviations here and there. The rapture theology teaches that the tribulation, which the Bible talks about just before the second coming of Jesus, will only affect the wicked. The children of God won't be affected by it. They will not go through that tribulation. God will secretly rapture them away. But first, literal Israel will take control of their homeland and then all believers will be raptured. A satanic figure, the Antichrist, will rise somewhere in Europe and he will grab the power over the world under this special 6-6 six, six sign. For three and a half years, he will persecute the Jews as well as the Christians who will in the end flee to 
They will flee to Petra, that ancient city in Jordan. And after seven years, Jesus will return and he will conquer the Antichrist and his army in the battle of Armageddon. And those Jews who have not yet converted, been converted, they will be brought to death. And shortly after that, the thousand years of peace will begin on earth. With Jesus reinstated as the high priest in the new temple that still has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And this will then be the forerunner of the new earth and of eternity. Now, if you visit Israel, you will see this golden lampstand that's already been made, waiting for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, if you read the footnote, it says, may it be rebuilt speedily in our days. That's what's believed in most of the Christendom today. Now let's ask ourselves, is this what the Bible teaches? Is this what the Bible teaches? Well, in the first place, we saw that the Bible states that the second coming will be visible and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And in the Revelation it states, Behold, he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him. And then it states it's going to be audible and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise. First. Now back to the question, what then about the rapture? Well, a few years ago, two people, Tim Lane and Jerry Jenkins, wrote a book which became the best seller of all times. The book's name, Left Behind. Here it is. I don't know whether you have read it, but so successful were they that in the end they wrote 15 books on this one subject, being the rapture. Well, Hollywood saw their chance and they also made a film of it. But let's just read what is said at the back of this book. A fictional thriller that illustrates one of the great truths of the Bible. You will have a difficult time putting it down. Another person, it seems to me he's got a doctorate in theology and in philosophy. Many scenes in this book could easily be the lead stories in tomorrow's news. Fascinating fiction. And then Dr. John Walford from Dallas says, the main feature in this story are not fiction. So the main features in the story are not fiction. Those not Prepared will be left behind. So remember that little phrase. No, those not prepared will be left behind. This book describes the dramatic days ahead. This is a book, here's a book that demands to be read. And then came the film, Left Behind. And Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3. Part 1, based on the best-selling novel, Left Behind, is this 
It's overflowing with suspense, action, and adventure. This riveting motion picture will take you on a spellbinding journey throughout the most mysterious book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So they're referring to the book of Revelation as if this is what the book of Revelation is saying. In one chaotic moment, millions of people around the world suddenly disappear, leaving their clothes, wedding rings, eyeglasses, and shoes in crumpled piles. And then enter airline pilot Rayford Steele. He's the main character in this whole story. A tall, ruggedly strong and good-looking man in his early 40s. His flying career has kept him away from his family, his wife and his two children, causing strain in his marital relationship, with consequently, which consequently pushes his wife, Irene, into devoting herself to the church and religious beliefs. And then Rayford Steele returns home from this chaotic, raptured flight. While he was in flight, the rapture happened and he finds his wife and his 11-year-old son gone. His 20-year-old daughter is still alive, out driving in her Isuzu truck when the rapture took place. And joined by our father and Buck Williams, they work together to find the truth and to search for their f missing family. That's part one of this film. And then comes part two, the tribulation. Now, it states there in this captivating sequel, journalist Buck Williams and a group of survivors known as the Tribulation Force know the truth about the new leader of the one world government. Uh, he's not come to save the world, he's not the Messiah, he is in actual fact the Antichrist. And then it says, a week after the rapture, the millions of people who disappeared into thin air are still missing. Chaos rules the world as survivors continue to search for their lost loved ones. And this man, Karpatia, has the world's adoration and trust, but is unaware of four rebels spreading the truth that he is, in fact, the prophesied Antichrist of the Bible. And as the tribulation force starts to spread the truth, global events get even stranger when word leaks out that three men have mysteriously burned, been burned to death at one of the holiest sites in Israel, naming the Wailing Wall. And then comes the third part of this film. In the prophesied book of the book of Revelation, and that's the point I want to make. The end is near. In the prophesied world of the book of Revelation, global icon and world leader, Nikolai, the Antichrist, Nikolai Karpatia, has done the unimaginable. He has managed to unite the world in peace and bring an end to the bloodshed that has ruled the world since the beginning of time. And then, in the end, the whole series ends. After they've been to Petra, there's uh, Petra. That's how it looks like. If you've never been there, we've seen it on TV. The whole series ends with Armageddon and then this statement at the back of the last of the 15 issues, the 15 books. Now this is noteworthy because we'll have to get an answer from the Bible about what's said here. Not all is well in Ethiopia. Although Jesus had established his thousand year kingdom, so that's been established. People are still born every day who need to accept him as savior, but do not. Those who came back from heaven with Christ, that's after the rapture now, do not age. Believers who survived the persecution do not die, but they do become older. The believers of the centuries, the heroes of old, help to reign in the new kingdom of peace. 
And while those who chose not to put their faith in Jesus are damned and die young, the followers of the other light, Lucifer, and I did not put in that capital letters. That's on the book itself. The followers of the other light, Lucifer, plan to have a massive army at the end of the thousand years. When Satan is loosened at the end to mislead the nations again, he leads this army into a final conflict, and the result thereof is the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. Now the question is, does the Bible talk about Satan being bound for a thousand years? Does the Bible talk about Satan being loosened at the end of the thousand years, misleading the nations with an army, leading an army into a final conflict? Yes, it does. It does. But is this, that's said here, what the Bible implies or not? And that's why there is a lecture which we will still come to on the thousand years. So don't miss that one. Now I think it's time to turn to the Bible again. Listen to how Jesus describes the end. He's talking about the time of the harvest. Talking about the end. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. And then he, he, he qualifies this harvest. Uh, as a matter of fact, Matthew 13, 40 states the same, says the same, Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. And then he qualifies what he was saying in verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. So that's clear. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Now, there's a, there's a key text that we should not miss when we talk about the second coming. We've looked at it, but let's, let's keep this in mind. Because it's Jesus talking here. Saying, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what is Jesus saying here? He says, If you want to know what is going to happen when I come again, look at what happened in the days of Noah. Because that, that, happened in the days of Noah, that's what's going to happen when I come again. That's what he's saying. Now, then the question, what happened in the days of Noah? Well, let's read. Matthew 24, 20, 38. For as in the days that before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that's quite clear, isn't it? Who was taken away? The wicked. Where to were they taken? Into the flood. What happened to them? They died. Now, listen carefully. The rapture theology teaches that there will be two groups at the second coming and both these groups will stay alive. Did you catch that? The one group will be raptured away while the other group stay alive to go through the tribulation. Two groups that both stay alive and it is nowhere to be found 
in the Bible. As in the days of Noah, were there two groups that both stayed alive? No. The one group was taken. Taken into the flood and died. Now, we know that Luke was a doctor. Listen to what Luke says. He's much more analytical when he describes uh, this event. Uh, he does it in Luke 17.26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And listen now how he puts it. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So who dies in the days of Noah? Who died? The wicked. Who stays alive in the day of no days of Noah? The righteous. So well, who will stay alive when Jesus comes? The righteous. Who will die when Jesus comes? The wicked. The unbeliever. Did those that were taken into the flood in Noah's days first live for another seven years before they died? No. And those who were taken into the ark, were they taken in, in secret? Or raptured away? No. They stayed in the ark. They even preached while building the ark for 120 years, warning the people, inviting them to come in. Nothing secret about anything in the days of Noah. So, let us just recap. There are those that believed in Jesus, but they have already died. What happens to them? at the second coming. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, what about those who are still alive when Jesus comes. Because there's going to be people, it might even be us, that's alive when Jesus comes. Listen. Then we, which are alive, and remain, shall what? Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with Him the Lord. Now, the third question. What will happen to the unbelievers who are still living when he comes? Because that's what the rapture is all about. That they will go through a tribulation. Listen to what the Bible says. After it's described how this will come to pass. The living unbelievers, when he comes, Revelation 19.21, and the rest were put to death with the sword of him who was on the horse, even the sword which came out of his mouth. They will be put to death. Now in Luke 17, we see the disciples even asking the question, what will in actual fact happen to them? Those who will die at the second coming. We hear them ask the question in Luke 17, 37, and they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Where? What happens to those that are taken away? Those who will die. What happens to them? Listen 
how Jesus answers them. A very strange answer. And he said to them, wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's in Luke 17, 38. Matthew also heard it. Matthew heard the same words. In his gospel he says, in verse 28, Matthew 24, Jesus said, wherever the dead body is, there will the eagles come together. And even Revelation describes it. Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. And the armies, the armies which were in heaven, followed him on white horses. Why is he bringing an army with him? Well, there's an enemy on earth that has to be conquered. And then we read in verse 21, And the rest were put to death with the sword of him who was on the horse, even the sword which came out of his mouth. In verse 17 we read, And I saw an angel taking his place in the sun, and he was crying with a loud voice, saying to all the birds in flight in the heavens, Come together to the great feast of our God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses. My brother and my sister, the Bible is clear. At the second coming, the earth will become one big graveyard. And the birds of heaven will have to clean it. There's going to be two feasts at the end. The feast in heaven where Jesus will be the host. The first, the feast on earth where the birds of the heaven will feast on dead bodies. Perhaps it would be wise to make sure that you have the right ticket to the right feast. Now the question where does the rapture come from. It's very interesting to note that when the Jesuit order was instated in 1534 by Ignatius Loyola, the Church of Rome called a council, the Council of Trent, in the year 1545, and that lasted for many years up until 1562, with the distinct agenda point and order to counter the reformation that was just started by Luther, Luther. And the fact being that the Reformers studied the Bible and they came to the conclusion that the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast from the sea in Revelation 13 is in fact nothing else than the empire of the Roman church, the Roman Catholicism, the Antichrist power. Well, at this Council of Trent, it was decided that someone needs to alter this view of the Reformers and that another interpretation of Daniel and Revelation regarding the Antichrist should be developed. And in the year 1561, just a year before they concluded with this council, they gave this work to Francis Ribera. And he started to write his doctoral thesis. In the end, calling it Futurism. He finished his doctorate in 1585 and he published it in 1590. Now, what does Futurism mean? teach. It teaches that the Popery is not the Antichrist because he will only appear at the end of time. 
It teaches that the Antichrist will reign for seven years in Jerusalem. That he will persecute Christians and Jews for the last three and a half years. That Jesus will come back after three and a half years, after the seven years, and he will conquer the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. And after this, a thousand years of peace commences on earth. Did you notice how brilliantly Francis Ribera did his thesis? Without anybody knowing it, what did he do? Did you realize that? He took the seven years which we had in Daniel 9, embedded in our 2,300 years prophecy, that seven years, which brings us to the cross of Jesus, which is in actual fact the heart of Christendom, of our faith, he took that seven years in that prophecy, cancelling that prophecy, he took that seven years and he put it right at the end of time. And nobody knows this. Brilliant. Brilliant to those who do not have the light. And does not know that you cannot take seven years out of that prophecy of Daniel. God will not allow that to take place. Now, where does the modern interpretation of the rapture come from? It comes from a man named Scofield, who also wrote a Bible, the Reference Scofield Reference Bible in 1909, reprinted in 1917. He got the theory from Nelson Darby, who again got it from Margaret MacDonald, who had a vision in 1830. What Schofield, in actual fact, did was to take Ribera's futurism and put it into a theology without any sustainable biblical reference. Yes, dear friends, it is a mystery. But the Bible is quite clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. When? When will that happen? At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on, put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. God wants to give the gift of everlasting life to every one of his children. But he wants to do more. He wants to give everyone a new body as well, a body resembling the body of Christ. Listen. So when this corruptible shall be put on in corruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Philippians 3.20 For our country is in heaven. From where the Savior, for whom we are waiting, will come. Even the Lord Christ by whom this poor body of ours will be changed into the image of the body of his glory. The Bible teaches the fact that our bodies will be resurrected and that we will receive a body like that of Jesus after his resurrection. The Bible does not teach the immortality of the soul but it does teach the immortality after the resurrection of the body.
Dear friends, I think nothing ought to be more important for a child of God as to prepare him or herself for that great and glorious day when Jesus comes in the clouds and you and I will be transferred, become incorruptible and will receive everlasting life. And that's why Luke concludes, watch you therefore. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. May we be found worthy that day to stand before the Son of Man.